Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Today we're going to talk about value-based healthcare, future trends in dermatology reimbursement. I'm your host, Michael Sherling, co-founder of Modernizing Medicine. I'm also joined by our product manager extraordinaire, Aaron Detry, who's a product manager of analytics. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this evening. So let's talk about the outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, how did we get here? How did we go from fee-for-service wonderfulness to value-based healthcare? And what are the new rules for payment? How are we going to get paid in the future? And finally, how can modernizing medicine with its technology increase the reimbursement pie when it's shrinking in certain respects? So why value-based healthcare isn't going away, or in other words, how we got here? So there's this thing called the federal budget, and it's about $3.5 trillion, and Medicare represents 14%, or almost $500 billion. If physicians' salaries, that, rec that, that represents 12% of Medicare, which is about $77 billion. And specialists, we, we cost more because we like to, because we're specially trained and we're awesome, but we also um, make up a, a lot of that reimbursement uh, percentage. So if you look at dermatology with our 10,000 providers, we, we, we spend about $2.2 .2 billion. We represent 1% of the physicians, yet we cost 3%. And so um, the government's trying to rein us in. So they have this initiative that you may have heard of called the Better, Smarter, Healthier Initiative, which was an announcement about a year ago that said 85% of all traditional Medicare payments are going to shift to quality or value by 2016 and 90% by 2018. And it seemed a little bit vague um, in, in, that, in that way of, well, how is this going to really work? And, and over time, the CMS has kind of outlined its plan to switch to value-based healthcare. And it starts with MACRA, which is the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015. What this act does is it repeals the sustainable growth rate formula. That's that docs fi that doc fix bill that we always get every year that almost stalls Congress, um, where they, they eventually give us um, you know, a bump uh, every year for reimbursement. Um, so that's going away. And instead, in its place, are these two paths that rewards clinicians for value over volume. The first is called the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS for short. And the second way is called Alternative Payment Models, or APMs. So we have a choice. We can take the blue pill like in the matrix, and we can you know, hang out and just have wool over our eyes, or we can take the red pill and we can see how, how far the rabbit hole goes. And I, I recommend taking the red pill. It's, it's a lot sweeter. Um, so, so we should really um, outline what these options are. So let's dive into alternative payment models. We hear them a lot, but we don't necessarily know what they mean, and so let's break them down. So there's Accountable Care Organizations, or ACOs. There are about 475 of them in the United States. 30,000 physicians are enrolled. The way an accountable care organization works is that it has physicians at the helm who decide to cut down on expenses. They can do this by decreasing referrals, decreasing ordering of tests, uh, decreasing the number of visits, and if they save money compared to a benchmark, they can split that savings with the payers. Well, this at the helm of an ACO is a primary care physician who can control referrals and, and, and split the savings, but specialists, we're on the other end of the spectrum. We're, we're not in control, and so that, that model may not work for us and our bottom line. The other options called medical home models, these are models to improve patient safety that, again, put the primary care physician and the patient at the center. There is no dermatologist in the medical home. It would be nice, but we, 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 that we're just not there. And finally, there's something called bundled payment initiatives. These are the 48 most expensive acute hospitalization initiatives, and the goal for the government is to say, if you can decrease these 48 most expensive inpatient hospitalizations, then we'll pay you. Unfortunately, dermatology is not, does not have any of the 48 uh, acute hospitalizations. So really, APMs is not a real choice. Yes, there's this 5% bonus for those that, that can participate successfully, but even them, not everybody who participates in alternative uh, payment model gets that 5% bonus. In fact, it's a very small subset that does. The ones that go most at risk, the ones that save the most money, they get the bonus. 
the most of the other people don't, they get rolled into MIPS. And so I really want to spend most of the time of this webinar talking about MIPS, but I want to really deconstruct APMs because I know there's this thought that and maybe we can participate in them, and I just want to dispel that myth at this time. There are going to be alternative payment models for dermatologists, but it's doubtful that we'll ever be in that uh, qualifying provider um, circle. So let's talk about merit-based incentive payment system. This is modified fee-for-service. It's still fee-for-service, but it's modified. And it's a total rebrand of physician quality reporting system, meaningful use, and the value-based modifier. Contrary to public opinion, meaningful use is not going away. It's just getting renamed into MIPS. So physicians that score in the top 70th five percentile or higher actually get to split an additional carrot of $500 million per year. So the sticks, um, while they're still there, the carrots are coming back, and this will actually um, create a new uh, market, uh, switchers market, so that people uh, can get onto systems that can help them navigate the MIPS waters. So let's deconstruct it. There are really four areas here uh, that, that perform a MIPS score. There's quality, there's resource use, there's clinical practice improvement activities, and there's the use of certified technology through Meaningful Use Renamed. Add them up, that gives you a MIPS score. That MIPS score determines how we get paid. So how do we get paid? Well, starting in 2017, less than a year away, we'll be judged by those four components. And if we do well, we can get bonuses of 4% in 2019, 5% in 2020, 7% in 2021, and 9% in 2022. If we do poorly, we get uh, penalties in that amount as well. This is budget neutral. And if there are people or physicians out there that don't want to be a part of this, that's great for us because then they'll fall into this uh, penalty box and the bonuses can triple up to 12%, 15%, 21%, and 27% because this has to be budget neutral. So if most physicians don't do this, then the rest of us get paid three times as much. So let's talk about the timeline. Uh, the measures uh, start um, in, 20, so 2017 is when we get judged. The penalty or, uh, or incentive is levied against us or for us in 2019. So there's a two-year gap between when we're evaluated and when, and when we get uh, bonused. The last year of meaningful use, PQRS, and the value-based modifier separated is this year, and the adjustments for that is in 2018. So let's break this down even further. What makes up a MIPS score? There's four things again. There's meaningful use, which is 25% of the score. There's quality, which is 30% of the score, like PQRS. And there's cost. So am I spending more than my peers uh, per Medicare beneficiary? That's 30% of the cost. And then there's 15% of the MIPS score, which is clinical practice improvement. And we'll get to that. So MIPS is graded on a curve. It's not like meaningful use, um, where if you just do it, you get you, you avoid the penalty, or like PQRS, where if you're above, you know, if you, you're paid for reporting, you're okay. It's going to grade all of us on a curve. There will be some performance threshold that we just don't know what it is, and 50% of us will be above the performance threshold, and 50% of us will be below it. And those above will get a bonus, those below will get a payment reduction. And because this is budget neutral, if there are late adopters to the scene, then those that perform well will tr can get up to triple the bonuses. Let's go for an example. Here, um, let's say that I get $500,000 of Medicare fees um, in 2017, and I participate in MIPS. That means I can participate, I get up to a $20,000 bonus, or I get a $20,000 penalty, or somewhere in between. There is no safe zone. Every physician is going to be lined up in a line, and there's a spectrum of negative 4% to positive 4%. So fast forward to 2022, that becomes $45,000 at risk, up or down. So let's, let's break this down further. So who is eligible? 
In the first two years of MIPS, it's going to be physicians, PA, nurse practitioners. In the following years, it'll be physical therapists and audiologists. Um, who's excluded from this merit-based incentive payment system? Um, those that are in eligible alternative payment models, which is not going to be any one of us. No dermatologists, really. It's going to be really the primary care physicians that are going at risk. Those that are low volume Medicare threshold, if you don't take Medicare, then you don't have to worry about MIPS, but most of us do. And providers who enroll in Medicare for the first year, so if you're out of residency, um, then you are exempt for the first year. So I want to talk about how the government's going to raise awareness on MIPS. And I'm going to break from my presentation and show you a website called Physician Compare. It is up. Um, so you can go ahead and search for yourself www.medicare.gov physician compare and you can type in your name. I'm just going to do it myself and I'll pick me. And here you can see um, that you're going to have a check mark with basically whether you reported quality measures or not. And uh, coming in, in 2019, you'll have a score there that's based on 2017 performance. And so this is all publicly available um, for everyone to look at. So why is that important? Well, I think we just need to raise awareness because in, uh, in 2014, out of 8,386 dermatologists, only 3,256 of them participated in PQRS. That's only 38% of derms, and only 2,698 of us uh, participated in meaningful use, um, which seems a little bit low to me. Um, and they, that, that just raises you know, a yellow flag that maybe these things are too onerous. But I'm proud to report that you know, at least 50% or above 50% of these numbers um, for, for PQRS and, and close to 50% for meaningful use were modernizing medicine customers. So let's, let's dive into MIPS. Let's talk about that 25% of the score meaningful use stage three and what it means. The government knows it's too onerous. They want more people to participate. They're cutting down the measures to only eight. They're going to focus on things like patient engagement and interoperability. Those buzz, buzzwords, engagement and interoperability, will be really important. <laughs> Modernizing medicine can prepare us with patient portals, uh, which we're developing, and our pledge for interoperability, which I'll talk about with the Commonwealth Health Alliance. Uh, quality matters. Uh, PQRS here. Modernizing medicine automates a lot of the, the, the PQRS documentation, and we're a registry ourselves. And it's not just performing or participating in PQRS, now we have to perform well, and in some cases better than our peers. Um, and there are benchmarks that are available provided by CMS, but the problem is today they are lagging. They're two years behind. And so uh, by the time you know you're in trouble, it's too late. It's kind of like those old cars where you have the gas light and you're driving in the middle of the highway and you've run out of gas and then the light comes on. Um, that's what it's like because if you're a provider and you want the feedback during the year you're being judged, not two years after the fact. And the fact that they're giving me means in 2013 of PQRS performance when it's 2015 and I'm being judged against 2015 numbers that I don't have is problematic. Um, costs matter. So just like quality will be judged on cost, that's another 30% of the score, and it's cost per capita per Medicare beneficiary. So if I'm doing a lot of freezing of AKs and biopsies on one patient, I may perform um, more poorly than someone who has a lot of Medicare beneficiaries that maybe performs less biopsies, less cryotherapies, et cetera. And just like quality, uh, Medicare provides this feedback that's too late. This is the value-based modifier report. It shows you where you stand in terms of cost. But the problem is it tells you this after it decided whether to bonus you or penalize you, which isn't quick enough for me. I want that feedback during the year so that I can make changes so I can perform better. Practice improvement. Um, so here, uh, practice improvement includes expanding practice access, uh, which we'll talk about how we're going to do that with telemedicine. Uh, population management. We're going to talk about how we do that with registries. Care coordination. We're going to talk about how we do that with our pledge for interoperability and others. So how do we navigate these waters? Well, Einstein said it best. You have to learn the rules of the game, and you have to play them better than everybody else. And we're going to help you play them better than everybody else. So how do we steer the ship? We're going to give you real patient engagement tools. 
We're going to automate quality data input like we already do with PQRS. We're going to provide you with the latest, highest tech analytical tools that you have ever seen, which give you real-time comparative benchmarking of quality and cost. But not just in the MIPS rules, because we know you're trying to run a business, we're also going to give you financial visibility to improve your bottom line and your operations. We're going to create population health registries, and we're going to improve interoperability. So how do we do that? Well, with patient engagement, we're going to build awesome patient portal systems. We have mobile um, applications, including telemedicine. Uh, we're going to have uh, patient reported outcomes and more. Uh, we already today uh, automate quality documentation automation, so physicians don't have to hire other people to enter in PQRS data, um, and they perform better than us, and we have a track record. We, in 2014, we had 1,607 dermatologists to test through PQRS through our system. That's over 50% of those that attest, that's almost 50% of those that have attested for PQRS, and this year, we have well over 2,000 um, that are doing PQRS with us because it's easier. Um, we'll provide a real-time quality benchmarking so you see not just how you're performing, but how you perform compared to the Medicare mean uh, that might be a little bit outdated, and another benchmark that we'll talk about that's called EMMA Compare. We'll talk about real-time cost benchmarking where we'll give you your CPT codes, break them down into RVUs and Medicare allowables, and talk about the total that you've billed based on RVUs, divide it by your total number of Medicare beneficiaries, and see if you're above or below the national average for every CPT code. And we're going to provide visibility to you with our product called ModMed Analytics, which is going to show, we'll demo the prototype at the American Academy of Dermatology meeting next week. But because you're joining us uh, today, we're going to give you a sneak peek of what that looks like actually right now. Erin, um, I'm going to make you presenter, and then I'll go ahead and narrate. OK, so what you're seeing here is uh, a demo of ModMed Analytics. And we're going to show you just the things that we can do for you and your practice. Uh, as part of uh, the acquisition of uh, GMED, which is gastroenterology leading EHR, um, they've had some expertise in, in analytics and that they've been powering 20 to 30 percent of the GI market with. And we're bringing some of those to you. We'll start with the ENM encounter sort. So what you're seeing here is in real time, uh, a, a, you know, a, a theoretical practice, um, the average number of encounters per provider, and a benchmark called EMMA Compare. So you can see, you know, for the year 2015, am I above or am I below? Do I see more patients or do I see less? That in and of itself isn't good nor bad, but it gives us a sense of where we are, which is kind of good for productivity standpoint as well as uh, some of the value-based healthcare initiatives. Here you can see your diagnosis frequency um, for ICD-10. You'll see something on the upper right-hand corner called modifier 25 use. That's very important because there's increasing audit scrutiny on the use of the 25 modifier, which allows dermatologists to bill visits and procedures. That 25 modifier use uh, benchmark, you can see where, where all the users of EMMA is. It's around 37%. And you want to make sure that you're kind of at or a little bit below that so that you're not at risk for audit. If you find yourself way, way above that, that's feedback for you that you can take um, before you get audited. And so that's a real competitive advantage for EMMA users. You'll see in the lower corners uh, your CPT code distribution. You know, are you billing more 99202s or less 99202s or 03s than the rest of the, the, rest of the um, market? And you can see not just your selections, but what the EMMA population is doing and what the CMS benchmark is. And that really, really is helpful. It gives us feedback because we always want to bill what, what's rightfully ours, but we just want to feel comfortable and be able to sleep at night that we're doing it in an ethical way. We can also show you um, established CPT distribution, uh, 99211s through 99215s. And here you can see for the market, beautiful curve here. This practice is doing well. The EMMA population is right in line with the CMS benchmark. It's like we know what we're doing. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so so that's, um, that's just one snapshot, which is more financially and operationally. Let's go to the next one. So here is just, you know, the other side of the coin. Instead of looking at visits, we're looking at procedures. And here you can see the breakdown of your procedures, um, where you are compared to where other practices are. There's something on the upper right-hand corner that I want to highlight, which is modifier 59 use. 
there's increasing scrutiny on this 59 modifier uh, for audits. Uh, CMS is cracking down on this. They want to make sure we're not doing too many procedures, and we're going to give you a benchmark nationally of where all EMA users are, and if you're at or below that, you're, you're, you're kind of in line with what, with what other people are doing. If you're way above that, you're at increase for audit. And Medicare counts these things. So we want to make sure you have this information um, so that you can make adjustments during the year instead of after the year. At the lower corner, you can see just your CPT code distribution and how that compares with, with everybody else. And so you can see, hey, how am I doing compared to other people? And that's really, really helpful. We're going to build additional um, features and functionalities that go way above MIPS, um, including things like uh, recall for patients. I know this is feedback that a lot of dermatologists really, really want. Uh, which is to say, if I have patients with skin cancer in 2014 and I did a skin check on them in 2014, is there ability for me to see that if they, if I, if they didn't show up in 2015? Because that's revenue in, in, in my practice and then I can then generate a list of those patients. Um, and, and the whole point of population health is to give you an ability to use the structured data to your advantage so that you make sure that you're providing good care, treating patients, with skin cancers, making sure that they don't miss your practice and, and, and it helps your bottom line as well. Uh, getting back to the merit-based incentive payment system, a thing called the PCURA scorecard, which we developed, I want to dive into one measure to give you a sense of how this works. This is measure 224, uh, which is um, uh, overutilization of melanoma. Here you can see this theoretical practice is 99.2% performance rate. Here's what the rest of CMS does and here's what our users do. Our users are better um, uh, because of the way we automate structured data. So we're ahead of the curve. That's what you want to see um, when you're selecting measures uh, for MIPS. You want to pick a measure that you're reporting on that you can perform well at because um, we're going to be uh, evaluated based on that. And here's another one, uh, uh, 224, a tobacco use. Here you can see um, how this person's doing and very, very closely the CMS benchmark is you know, around 89%. The EMA benchmark is around 90%. It's great to be above that benchmark, uh, obviously, uh, as we uh, get um, through MIPS. And the nice thing about these benchmarks is, unlike the CMS ones, th this is real time. And so you can see as you know, where you stand within the day as opposed to a, a notification two years after the fact. Um, excellent. So this just gives you a sense of what we're doing. We're building more functionality around it. We think this is going to be a huge help. Um, already 20 to 30 percent of the GI market uses these things to help their bottom line. We want you to have um, the latest and greatest and we believe that this is going to help us uh, not just perform well but make the pie bigger. Um, so let's talk more about um, the merit-based incentive payment system and how modernizing medicine is going to help uh, position us. Um, so but we have population health tools. Uh, today we work with many of the cancer registries uh, with the CDC and that's great for, for the registry component of meaningful use but they're increasing the, the uh, requirements to uh, two, two uh, registries and, and to be honest not many of us uh, perform immunizations, not many of us do syndromic surveillance and so we are going to create disease specific registries this year for dermatologists so that they can complete um, this for meaningful use as well as the practice improvement component for MIPS. And so we're, we're on the bleeding edge. We're going to help you guys and, and make this easier. The next is our pledge to interoperability. Um, the future of healthcare is, is coordinated care. And there's an alliance called the Commonwealth Health Alliance, which is really backed by the leading um, EHR vendors. There's not many of us. Uh, they include the founding members like Athena Health, McKesson, Cerner, uh, Greenway, and contributing members like Modernizing Medicine. And, and because we're going to have ways of interoperating with these, these systems, patients who go to one vendor who may not have modernizing medicine, maybe they're an internist, you'll be able to see uh, certain data elements um, within modernizing medicine. And we're in lots of money in this um, because we want to we make sure that patient care is improved and we want to make sure that you um, fulfill your, your practice improvement um, for MIPS, which includes care coordination. So data sharing is about to get way easier, and for cloud-based solutions, um, they're better positioned to take advantage of things like the Commonwealth Health Alliance and, and interoperability in general versus client-server solutions, which um, have to make updates each time uh, to really deliver uh, what they need to. 
So that's really dealing with you know a shrinking pie. Let's talk about how to make the pie bigger. I'm really excited about telehealth. I think it's a real way for dermatologists to thrive. Um, and, taking mobile health just a step further. There is reimbursement, there is an um, act that's being proposed, bipartisan, um, in Congress, which is the Connect for Health Act. It's right in Congress now. We, we are bullish that it will be passed uh, with uh, taking effect January 1 of 2017. It proposes that telehealth should be re reimbursed by CMS, not just uh, synchronous telehealth, which is live interactive, but also store and forward telehealth, which is the telehealth solution that we have today in beta. Now, store and forward telehealth is when a patient can download an app from the App Store, Modernizing Medicine Telehealth. They can take a picture of their condition, like acne or psoriasis. They can forward that to you as the dermatologist, which seamlessly interfaces with Modernizing Medicine's Emma, and you can, create, you can uh, make a diagnosis and send a prescription. Today, um, because this isn't really covered by insurance, you can charge uh, for this fee for your services and, and, and get, and get um, a nice revenue stream for your practice. If this does, um, does become part of Medicare or in 2017 or, or beyond, uh, it is likely that this will be part of an alternative payment model, giving dermatologists another path for value-based healthcare. But more importantly, it improves patient access, it provides timely care for your follow-up patients, and you'll get paid for your time which is a, a nice way that technology can help bring real value. So in closing thoughts, uh, how do we just not survive, but how do we thrive with value-based healthcare? Well, Modernizing Medicine has already invested significant amounts of money in the technology that can help you play the game better, whether that's real-time benchmarking for quality and cost so that you're ahead of the curve for value-based healthcare, or business intelligence tools that can help you just make your business better financially or operationally. We're creating registries for population health uh, to help you do well and meaningfully use stage three and the practice improvement component of MIPS. We're providing mobile technology for patient engagement with next generation applications like telehealth. And we have a pledge to interoperability um, where we're investing you know, over $100,000 in making sure that physicians can connect uh, through the Commonwealth Health Alliance. And finally, it isn't just about playing with a shrinking pie, it's making the pie bigger for all of us. We can do that with telehealth, providing services to our patients so they don't have to wait two months to see us, and we don't have to spend 15 minutes to make a diagnosis. It's a win-win for everyone, and I think it'll really, really make a modernizing medicine a differentiated product. So really, um, there's going to be a shift you know, away from these, these legacy systems that just can't keep up with innovation towards... Um, towards these more advanced systems. So we're going to shift away from EHR adoption, which was what Meaningful Use was all about. It, was, it made its point. It got people to digitize healthcare, but it isn't just about converting paper records to digital form. It's about saving doctors time and helping their bottom line. So really, the EHRs that can operationalize our business, that can make it faster but also more profitable, are the ones that are going to win. And those are the ones that are cloud-based. Those are the ones that are going to ensure interoperability, provide data analytics, and initiate patient engagement. And these are really our cloud-based systems, the ones that can innovate faster and keep up with the changing regulations. And old platforms are going to die out and give way to newer ones. So, you know, MU was important for what it did, but it doesn't have a great track record. Here you can see, you know, 2015 percent of physicians that have demonstrated meaningful use, all specialties. You know, we're about 53 percent in Florida. We're about, you know, you know, 50% uh, in Tennessee. That's not great. And if you look at specialties like dermatology, it's even less than that, obviously, in the 30s. So we can do better. You need the right technology so you're not having to hire all these people um, that, that, that can put in data entry for you. We have these services today. In my opinion, they're underutilized. You know, we can provide a lot of value for you for the amount of money that's at stake. It's an ROI worth looking at. And, and we'll, we can break that down for you, and your sales team can as well. So how to get out. You're on this system that doesn't work for you. Um, you know, we have a program that can convert you. Um, so we've just developed a conversion tool uh, to get you off of the system you're on to Emma. It captures discrete elements like demographics, medications, allergies, problem lists, um, and, and some systems, depending upon their granularity, um, disease-specific past medical history. We can also take um, unstructured data, such as progress notes, 
uploaded attachments and images. And because we're standing by our commitment, we're, we're offering up to a $50,000 conversion credit for practices that want to leave their legacy EHR systems. So we're trying to lower the barriers for you. We're trying to make it as painless as possible. Yes, you're going to have to take somewhat of a leap, but it's better to do it now and get used to it and, and take advantage of all of the things that we have to offer, like telehealth and ModMed Analytics, than to do it later and get penalized by MIPS. So it's the age of the advanced EHR. For those of you that are on Emma, um, thank you. And for those of you that aren't, it's time to get on with ModMed Analytics, providing uh, benchmarking, real-time benchmarking with MIPS and ModMed Telehealth. Thank you so much for your time. And um, with that, I'd like to do a poll um, just to get a sense of just who's on the call and and where we are. So I'm going to launch a poll and 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 just uh, if you can answer this question, that would be great. All right. Giving people enough time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close that. I'm gonna do the next question, and I'd love to know: um, Have you successfully tested for meaningful use and use PCure software? And if if you failed either one of those, just just say no. All right, I'm gonna go to the next one. Uh, was the process cumbersome? Um, so for those of you who tested, did you feel supported? Did you feel like? Um, you, you attested successfully, or was it like doing your taxes, and you wanted help? And for those of you who have selected no, we do have a, a, a nice services team uh, called Emma Cares, where we can walk you through meaningful use if you don't want to deal with that, and we're going to invest more in uh, people to support PQRS as well. And uh, finally, um, if you're not an Emma user, um, are you interested in converting to Emma? And there's a $50,000 credit for you if you are. Thank you. And um, if you're interested um, in, in learning about more uh, the conversion credit, um, if you can just click yes on this. Well, thank you so much. And I'm, I'd love to open it up for questions. You can just chat them in the box. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have on MIPS really anything. Um, so, so um, you know, if you're interested in value-based healthcare and you just have a question uh, about it, you can just chat it in and I'm happy to answer anything. Okay. Um, uh, Amy asks, is there a cost for the dashboard benchmarking? We are, we do have um, um, a cost to us to modernizing medicine, but um, we'll make sure that we, we um, finalize what that is. Um, we will be able to demonstrate an ROI on that with, with patient recalls for lost skin cancer visits you're going to make up on it really, really quickly. But we will, um, it's at a prototype stage, and but we expect to uh, launch this um, very shortly um, uh, this year. Um, somebody asks, with the value-based modifier, is it based on our tax ID for all 10 providers? Does the benchmark in Emma show practice as a whole or each individual provider? Benchmarks can show um, anything you want. Um, it, it can be uh, individual providers. It could be the group itself aggregated. It could be different facilities if you have multiple facilities or sites, you can you, you can slice and dice. It's, it's a very powerful system. Um, Asamini asks, can I uh, alpha or beta test the uh, dashboard? Absolutely. We'd love and welcome that. We'd love feedback on what you need to, um, uh, to increase your profitability. We're happy to do that. Uh, Patricia asks, will ModMed Analytics be included in the MR or is it a separate cost? We will have abilities of bundles of ModMed Analytics with our practice management system. Um, and so there could be an opportunity there for bundled pricing uh, once uh, that launches, which will be this year as well. The launch date for our practice management system is July 4th. It's your independence from your practice management system that you're using now. Uh, Amy asks, will telehealth interf uh, with telehealth interfaces with Emma, will, uh, may, must we utilize billing through Emma or can we sign up for telehealth without using Emma billing? So the way telehealth is going to work through modernizing medicine is it's going to have a waiver. A waiver waiver for um, a, a Medicare waiver as well as a commercial carrier waiver that your patients sign, basically stating currently that um, most insurance carriers don't accept uh, Medi Medicare, uh, uh, sorry, uh, CPT codes for telehealth for store and forward. Uh, you sign this basically saying that you'll um, pay cash for this. Uh, me modernizing medicine then will generate the proper CPT code and then your practice can decide whether they submit that or not submit that. Um, to insurance companies based on your uh, contracting with your insurance companies. For the most majority of us, since this is so new, um, we don't really um, contract uh, with this. 
Um, so uh, just to let you know that the $50,000 credit um, is only valid for conversion through March uh, 31st. I wanted to make sure. Um, uh, somebody asked, will the presentation be on MS Central? Yes, we will, we will definitely um, have it on MS Central for all of those that missed. And please forward it to your office managers uh, as well as any colleagues that you think may be interested in modernizing medicine who has a uh, system that they don't like. Um, when will ModMed Analytics launch? It's prototyped um, at the American Academy of Dermatology. Come by our booth, check it out, and uh, we will uh, have a beta period. For those of you that are interested in beta, you'll be, you'll be able to sign up for it at the booth. And then after that, um, pending feedback, it'll be generally available. Uh, somebody asked, should, dermat should dermatologists join ACOs? Um, again, that's a decision that you have to decide for yourself. Um, I think that you know, with the merit-based incentive payment system and the investments that we're making, I, I think that the best path forward for bonuses is going to be through MIPS for a dermatologist. I think if you're a primary care physician, it's a different story, but for a specialist, I think MIPS is the way to go. That's my personal opinion, not that of modernizing medicine. Um, somebody asks, for current EMA users, will these new features be included? Um, so it's, uh, we are innovating as much as fast as we can. Uh, certain things like uh, patient portal and disease-based registries um, you know, will be included. Other things where we have um, costs, um, uh, like uh, the ModMed Analytics dashboard may not. Um, but uh, there'll be ways for you to more than make up the return on investment with things like uh, recalls for missed cancer patients and things like that. Uh, telemedicine, uh, we don't charge. Uh, we do charge a transaction fee uh, to telemedicine uh, per visit, but you get to charge the patient. So uh, you make you make money on every uh, transaction for telehealth. Um, uh, somebody asks, uh, when you get a sense for the PKRS reports will be available for review in 2016, uh, here are you loud and clear. Uh, there are lots of really new measures that we're coding in real time. Unfortunately, the government releases uh, the 2016 measures in like 20, the end of 2015, so we're busy coding all of the new ones in, and as soon as that's available, we'll have the 2016 reporting up and ready. Uh, you'll, we will then uh, run a script that goes back in time to January 1 so that you won't miss a single patient uh, for your 2016 measures, including the new ones. Um, the webinar will be available on MS Central. Um, will you be conducting another webinar? I would be happy to conduct another webinar uh, to do this again. And we will announce uh, that webinar with um, more time for more physicians. Uh, someone asks, how much is the Commonwealth Health, Commonwealth Health Alliance platform in order to link Emma with other EHRs? Um, that's not something we really talked about. We're trying to build a platform um, that just interfaces on a baseline. and so. We're hopeful that, that our own users can just benefit from it. Um, that would be my goal, but until um, we have the specs and features, um, I'm not sure. Um, but the goal, I think, there would be for you to be able to see any patient's history from any EHR that, that, that uh, participates in the Commonwealth Health Alliance without having to deal with faxing pieces of paper. Uh, paper is evil, and it kills trees. We don't like paper. Um, okay. Got it. Um, good. Um, next one. As current MA users, carry users, how will that program change for MIPS? Um, we're just building on it. So I think you know your 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 MU safeguard people will be MIPS safeguard people that will teach you about meaningful use, um, cost, quality, practice improvement. They'll just be your coach, and um, we'll expand the services to meet the changing regulations. Next question. Um, I assume the analytics come with the PM part of EMMA and not just we have an EMR. Actually, you'll get analytics either way. Modernizing medicine creates dynamically all the CPT codes, whether you have the PM system or not. You'll get the benchmarking that you need from a cost perspective and from a uh, value perspective. But having the PM, there'll be amazing things that we can do above and beyond, like like um, uh, you know CPT codes by payer. Or whether you have a, you know, what, what your contract rates are per payer, um, amazing things that you'll probably want. So my advice to you is, yes, you can do it, but you probably want the PM system too. Um, Anne asks, in order to use analytics, do you need to have the Emma practice management system? Nope, you can use it without it. Jack asks, um, uh, Jack wants to mean, what do you mean about not spending money to hire more employees? I would say, Jack, we have Emma Cares, which is a coach 
that can, can look at your meaningful use reports, that can look at your PQRS reports, that can help you um, so that you're not reliant on other people. And um, there is a way. We'll help. Uh, Amy asks, with telehealth, do we have to pay to pee to Emma, uh, sorry, a fee to Emma, uh, to using it, your telehealth software? I mean, it's a transactional fee, um, which is about $10 a transaction. But if you charge, you know, $50, then, then you're, 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 you're making, you know, obviously more than what we're charging. Um, Kathy wants to beta test. Um, Bill asks, will the upcoming election impact any of this as Obama care is repealed? I'm going to say, you know, no on this. I think that, you know, reigning in health care costs is probably something Republicans and Democrats both want to do. A lot of these um, things have bipartisan support, including telehealth. They believe that telehealth will save $100 billion in, in, in health care expenditures. So I'm going to say um, Republicans don't like to spend money and Democrats want to, you know, obviously improve health care quality. So I'm going to go with this is probably not... Um, something that will be repealed regardless of who gets in office. Although don't hold me to that because I'm not the president. Um, Amy asks, when MIPS comes in 2017, will we attest as usual for meaningful use? Uh, uh, PQRS are currently separate now. Uh, I believe that it'll be um, just rebranded, um, but until uh, we get the final rule finalized, which will be later in Q4 this year, um, we may not know that, um, but yes, um, these will the, the, your your score will be formulated based on 2017 participation and 2019. Uh, Amy asks, uh, telehealth a one problem solution? We intentionally made telehealth a one problem solution because we didn't think it was right for patients to do oh by the way oh by the way oh by the way show me this show me this show me this show me this. Um, but we do let them. Um, pay as many times as they want uh, for your time. So if they really want to have three problems, like acne, psoriasis, et cetera, then they can pay for it. Uh, Patricia asks, uh, to clarify, in order to sign up for the beta test for Mind Analytics, but th must that take place at AAD, or can we contact someone separately for those not going to AAD? Um, feel free to contact, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put her on the spot, Erin Detry, and she can chat in her email address uh, for those of you that want to play. Uh, Bill asks, um, he liked the telehealth solution. You should check it out. Patricia asks, um, I think she, I think we got that one. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your time. Um, a, a big favor to me would be if, if you know somebody who's on paper or on another system and they're struggling, please, please, please tell them about what you've seen tonight. Um, we're trying to really lead the way, and if you could refer them to, uh, for a demo, uh, we would really appreciate it. Um, our goal is to make this as easy as possible for all dermatologists. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your evening, and um, I'll do this again sometime real soon.